All right. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, I am doing this Facebook Live on StreamYard, so this should go smoother. It should be so much more professional than the failures I've had in the past. So thank you for joining me. And with me is a fellow bulletin writer, Virgie Tovar. By the way, I'm Jane Wells with Wells Street at janewells.bulletin.com. And Virgie is with, name your bulletin. Uh, Body Positive University. So bodypositiveuniversity.bulletin.com. Yes, let me, I have all these banners there it is see i'm learning so much and also subscribe to me and to virgie okay so you can comment in the comment section and we will try to get to your questions but basically the reason why i wanted to interview virgie is i'm a subscriber of your bulletin mm -hmm. and it's really been great for me and very um educational because it's opened my eyes to maybe my own prejudices and and mm -hmm. some of the tropes that i've bought into in the past and I, I've done some stories about uh, and done some research into marketing and to the plus size community, which is really the ma majority community, it sounds like right now. Yeah. And I wanted to talk to Virgie folks about sort of do's and don'ts with brands and some horror stories and hopeful stories that she has seen out there. And and the maybe the growing buying power or the misunderstood buying power of people who are size 14 or larger, which is sort of, I guess, the technical definition of plus size. So again, send us comments and Virgie, thank you for joining me and, and being willing to talk about this. First of all, tell me about Body Positive University, uh, your bulletin and why you did this. Yeah, I mean, um, so I've been in this area for about 10 years. Um, I um, am someone who experienced weight discrimination growing up um, and it really impacted the trajectory of my life. Um, and I mean, when I think about just sort of the consumer side, I mean, just literally anything you can imagine, um, like clothing or shoes. I just remember being a little girl and, you know, there were the, the uniform little princess package with the shoes and the little crown and the shoes never fit and the bracelet never fit and the ring never fit, you know, and, and I mean, I remember growing up and, you know, even my physical education uniform like didn't fit and only came up to a certain size. So I was wearing this tiny uncomfortable thing for, you know, two or three years um, in middle school, I remember. And so um, I experienced a lot of, you know, the emotional side, which was people kind of constantly telling me that something was wrong with me. And then I completely internalized it and was like, oh, you know, something is wrong with me. I need to change my body. I need to dedicate myself to becoming a thin person. And I've, you know, I've since learned, I mean, I've gone to graduate school and done research on this topic and, and dedicated my life to this. And, and the truth of the matter is, if you're a larger bodied person, um, naturally, you know, if you're, if you're just, if your parents are larger bodied or you just have always been larger bodied, um, the statistics are very clear that you're never going to be a thin person. I mean, with the exception of like a very tiny minority. Um, and so I think what's, what's difficult is like our culture still sees this issue as sort of a mutable elective characteristic, but the data don't really um, bear that out. So uh, anyway, a body positive university is all about not only um, explaining what weight discrimination is and what it looks like, um, but it's also about repairing, repairing our relationship to food, repairing our relationship to our body. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, that those, those dual visions are what Body Positive University is really about. It had to take a lot of courage to be out there about it though, wasn't it? I mean, you, and because even when I posted this, um, Facebook live, I thought I might get some, um, off color jokes. I didn't, which I think is progress, but you know, there's a lot of hate out there and it must've been uh, taking courage for you to stand up and say, I'm going to write about this. Yeah. I mean, I think, I don't know. It's interesting. Cause I feel like what really pushed me was, um, righteousness and anger. I mean, more, more so than Kurt. I was just like, this is unacceptable. I think once I learned that what fat phobia was, I mean, because, you know, in our culture, we don't understand our attitudes towards larger bodied people as a form of discrimination. We see it as a manifestation of health. Um, and so when I learned that uh, this was not about health, that it was absolutely about bigotry and discrimination, it really changed how I saw 
my own life and how I saw the culture. And I think I felt, and again, with an academic background, I felt like I had, I had the tools to unlock it. I was like, oh, here's the history. Here's the data. I had all the tools to kind of say, this is discrimination. This is how we can end this. And I think there was sort of a sense of like, well, I've got the resources and, a, and I was growing a platform, you know, 10 years ago to, to really potentially eradicate this. And I feel like we're really on the, we're at the beginning stages of it, which is exciting. <laughs> I think so. I mean, it's funny. You give it gives new meaning to the word bigotry. I'm sorry. I'm all about the puns. Uh, but uh, when, but are you making progress in terms like I interviewed a, a plus size influencer on Instagram who said that some plus size models don't even want to be called plus size models, don't even see themselves as plus size models before we move into marketing and merchandising. I mean, it's sort of what is the self image? of a lot of people, particularly women who are size 14 or larger, do you think? Do they see themselves or it's like, you know, this is something I'm going to fix in 2022. I don't know your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, um, I think a couple of things, right? Like I think about a plus size model, there, there, in my mind, there may be two potential reasons why a plus size model might, want, might, might not want to be designated as such. One could be potentially shame or not wanting to be associated with that. But the other one might be the belief that, you know, having a special designation for 70% of the market <laughs> is really not appropriate. Um, and and there's really it's like it's I have a body, you have a body, I have the body type of seventy percent of the women in this country. Why should I have a special category? You know, um, and, and so I mean I understand I mean I understand kind of both uh, you know I understand the origin of of both of those stances. I think for a lot of people, right? When you think about, we live in a culture that has a lot of fat phobia. We live in a culture that, as I mentioned, still is telling people that there that fat is a problem that a fat person is a failed thin person um, and that there's a solution, quote unquote, to, I mean, and specifically, right? Like, I think what's important to, to recognize is it's not that people don't want to be fat. It's that people don't want to experience a discrimination that fat people do. There is no inherent value to one body or another, but, you know, any, if you had any characteristic, any characteristic that it was like very consistently and systematically debased, and you were humiliated around consistently, you would absolutely have unresolved shame around that part of your identity. So it makes complete sense to me that like, I mean, you know, I'm still working through even moments when I experience bigotry. I've just, after 10 years, just started being able to sort of place the onus of shame on that person. Like that person should be ashamed of themselves. I should not be ashamed of myself and really believing that, you know? So I think it takes a long time to like recover that sense of dignity, you know? Can, can you give me an example where you recently said, oh no, hold on, wait a minute. Yeah. I mean, this, like, uh, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't like, I'm thinking about like, I, I, okay. I'll think of an example. Like this is actually couple, before COVID, but right before COVID, I was just having a coffee in a, you know, a cute little town that I don't live in. Um, and this woman came up to me and just started giving me dietary advice. Like, you know, Oh, you just need to stop eating pork. That's the most important thing about not being <laughs> fat. And I, I was like, you know, I was very jarring to just be interrupted during my coffee to, to be told something very strange like that um and, and and so presumptuous right like you have no idea you literally look at me and you presume whatever i could be a vegan i could be a it's impossible for you to imagine that i might be a vegetarian me. or a vegan or whatever me. you know yeah. it's like um or oh my god pork. um but anyway so uh yeah with her what you I say to her um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember exactly what I said, but essentially I was like, this is not something that I consent to, to having. I do not consent to this conversation. I do not consent to this. This is not helpful. And I do not want it and do not do this to anyone else. Um, wow. and, and I think, you know, in that moment, I'm like able to kind of recognize, um, I'm just sitting here being a person. You have gone out of your way to be a bigot. Um, and you know, and, and it's like, you have done the wrong thing. I have done nothing wrong by sitting here being in my body that I was born with, um, drinking oh coffee. God. And so, you know, but I, I mean, I think like in the past I would have internalized that, or I would have thanked her and tried to cut out pork or whatever, like weird thing. I would have actually just rolled with it. 
Or I would have, you know, just said thank you and moved on and felt terrible about myself. But I just was like, no, like this woman should feel terrible about herself. And I really hope that she doesn't feel like she has the right, because it's just entitlement, that level of entitlement, which goes, which is sort of like the, the corollary of bigotry. Um, you know, I just, I just found her entitlement to be staggering. Um, you know, so I, I didn't feel any sense of like, I had done anything wrong or I was ashamed of myself. I was like, yes, I am fat. Yes. I understand that you can see that I'm fat. And it's absolutely your problem. If you have an issue with that. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh. I could, but see, like that would ruin my whole day. That mm. would ruin my whole day. Uh, so thank you for sharing that with me. Now I want to throw out some stats because you mentioned 70%. CNBC mm. reported in a story where um, I think it was Old Navy or Banana Republic. Some I must have been Old Navy was going to uh, sort of expand and do something yeah, with it's its, Old Navy. Uh, yeah. yeah, with a size 14 and above. And they said that it was a $32 billion, the plus size market apparel market is $32 billion women's apparel. But that's only 20% of the women's apparel market. Now, 70% of the women in this country get 20% of the apparel market. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a factor of there's just not enough apparel or the spending power is not there? When you hear something like that, Oh, gee, we've grabbed 20% of the market. Yeah, but we're 70% of the market in, in terms of people. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of factors. Um, I mean, it's definitely not buying power. So, for example, so like Old Navy is um, under the umbrella of Gap Inc. Um, and Ath Athleta, who's the you know the athletic wear brand side of Gap Inc., um, they kind of were really the spear they spearheaded kind of this initiative, which I think they're going house by house. They're like from within Gap, um, but but they found they did the research. They found that. Um, their athletic, their plus size customers spent 90% more than their straight size customer and came back twice as often. So, I mean, right, like, you know, the, the market research, I mean, again, like, I think like the buying power is there. Um, I don't think there's a lot of, unfortunately, until very recently, that research just simply wasn't, that market research just wasn't there, you know, like literally there. I, mean, I remember talking to the the founder of 11 Honoré, which is like a plus size yes. um, luxury brand. Patrick Kerning, yeah. Yeah, Patrick. So I, I remember talking to Patrick three years ago and he was like, yeah, I'm trying to go into VC meetings and I've got nothing but like intuition and anecdotes to share because these women aren't even being studied because they've just, they've just decided that like, mm, there's no way that fat women want to stay fat. There's no way that fat women will buy clothing for their fat bodies because they don't want to be fat. Um, and it, I mean, I think a lot, and it's not to say that there aren't plus size consumers who have that feeling, but I think that this was a lot of, you know, sort of prejudicial, bigoted thinking that allowed them to essentially ignore that market. Really, like, like imagine if, if there was a 70% market in, in any other arena, they would figure out how to get to it. Right. I mean, I just think about like, you but, know, but I, I think you've hit on something. I think you've hit on something that the sense that uh, the larger you are, the less you have to spend. And Patrick, one reason why he told me, I interviewed him before he started 11 on Array, which for folks who don't know, is sort of a couture, plus size couture, where these couture houses are making, re-engineering fashion for larger bodies. And he, you know, he was attracted to it, he said, because growing up gay, he also felt marginalized. And so when he worked with a plus size designer, or he, he got into it, and he discovered that there are women who are a size whatever who do have money and i think mm -hmm. the theory has been that it's been harder to get a, a a good job it's been harder to get a promotion it's been harder to get more pay because you're large uh it, what is your experience with that well because in terms of the buying power what is your experience with that and do you see any change yeah, I mean, certainly there is an income gap between plus size women and straight size women. Um, it's anywhere between like nine and nineteen, nine thousand and nineteen thousand dollars a year. Um, so it's pretty sizable. Um, you know, I, I don't. I mean, again, like I think obviously that it does impact buying power to a certain extent, but, you know, I, I don't necessarily like income isn't necessarily about proportion of money spent on fashion for the average 
person. Um, so, you know, I just want to put that out there. Like that's not, that, that figure is important, but it's not necessarily going to correlate to, it's not going to correlate one-to-one -to, -one to buying power. Um, I mean, certainly for me, like I came, I'm, I'm a creative I'm, I'm an entrepreneur because I couldn't get hired in, like I live in San Francisco. I could not get hired in an office in San Francisco to save my life. And I, I do, I mean, ultimately, and I found that I would get through all the rounds of interviews. So all the, you know, the, the initial rounds of interviews would always be with women who always found me to be like interesting and competent and all that. Right. Um, and, and then the, the final interview would always be with a man. Um, and it would always, you know, and the minute that I, that I sort of saw, I mean, I remember one interview in particular, I got to like the third or fourth round. It was some ridiculous number of rounds. Um, and uh, and the final round was with this um, straight man. And I just, he body checked me and then sort of walked me to his office. And every single woman on the way, he flirted with every thin, you know, traditionally attractive woman on the way to his office. And I knew, I mean, I was like, there's no point in even spending 30 minutes or 20 minutes with this man, he's not going to hire me um, because I, he doesn't want to sleep with me. Like, and, 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 like obviously you have something to say about me, like, but that's, that's misogyny as well. I feel bad for those women, right. That have to like deal oh, with this man. day in and day out. But like, in addition to that, the, the misogyny was sort of stacking onto fat phobia in a way that like wasn't working for me. Um, and so I, I mean, I, yeah, essentially I felt you know, I kind of, there's a part of me that thinks I would have always ended up in the entrepreneurial space, but certainly fat phobia played a huge role in how, how quickly and at what age I went into working for myself. That's amazing. Um, you were just in Riyadh. What the heck? What was that all about? Yeah. So I got invited to um, speak at a, um, a, a conference called Fashion Futures, and it was all about inclusivity and the future of fashion. Um, and yeah, it was in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is like rapidly, Riyadh in particular, it has its eye on becoming the next Dubai. I mean, they have just, I, they had, a, um, the, this conference was absolutely incredible. There were so many amazing people there from like from Vogue, from Saks, from, you know, Kristen Dior, from like just all of these incredible um, people. And then also all of these smaller brands and innovators who are focused on sustainability and changing how um, the pipeline works. Like I met somebody who he started the fashion in the fashion technology department at FIT. Um, and he has this incredible machine that can render 3D form. So you put a person in there and you create like a 3D form that you can use to create looks. And so we've been talking about collaborating on, on writing about that for what the implications of that technology might be for plus size. So that, that was really incredible. And there was also like a, they had a Biennale. Um, it was the first time public visual art had been displayed in, in Saudi ever. And, and it was just a very important moment. Like they're really kind of they're really um, focused on modernizing and, and kind of um, becoming like a world-class city. And it just, the people are amazing. The the country is incredible. The women are amazing, right? Um, really? Really? Yeah. Because yeah. I think of that as being a place where women are very restricted. Yeah. I mean, well, three years ago, so they have a new crown prince. And three years ago, he um, just declared that women could drive. Women didn't have to cover their heads anymore. And women could have their own identification. Um, like before that, um, their identity, they didn't have an identity. It was their father, a picture of the father. Yeah. And their ID. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it has been restrictive. Yeah. The, but the, I think crown, the crown prince has had some issues. We won't go into the politics. Yeah, of it, but sure. The fact is you found it. Uh, uh, like size inclusive, that it was very sort of forward thinking and that sort of, you found it there. I mean, I don't know. I, I was hard for me to get a sense of um, what the plus size sort of vibe was there. Um, I think fabric, like just even how a garment is constructed there is a hundred percent, like totally different um, in a lot of ways from the way that it's constructed, you know, in, in the U S or, or in Europe. Um, so there's a lot of differences, but, but I found like the, the women, um, you know, I think because they've had to, navigate such a patriarchal culture they are they're just extraordinary they're gracious they're kind they're they're smart they're motivated it's just i'm just like really excited to see wow. where they're going to take the country uh <laughs> yes. well then i'm optimistic to hear you say that uh yeah. let's let's talk about brands in the u.s um whether it's apparel or travel or i don't know vacation rentals or homes or bets i did the story on big fig which was fascinating because 
uh, Big Fig, which if you go to janewells.bulletin.com, you can read it. it was a, a mattress company that was born out of another mattress company in Cleveland called White Dove. And they realized, this was the backstory of Ergy. They would realize at White Dove when people, when plus size customers would come in to buy a mattress, they would be sold the most expensive mattress because more likely than not, they would return before the warranty expired because the mattress was not supportive and they would get another mattress because the warranty had not expired. Mm -hmm. And so partly for that and also for reasons like, look, here's a market. They created Big Fig, which is a standalone mattress company. They re-engineered the mattress. I mean, I think you said you have one. They're 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 incredible. They're not overpriced. They have, mm -hmm. I think, a twenty year warranty. I mean, it was like a ridiculous warranty, yeah. um, and have they're doing millions of dollars and and growing. They now have created what they called. Um, Oh, a big fig advisory board or something from customers mm. to advise them on how do we approach this market? How do we market to this market? Because there's a lot of um, concerns about words to use. But first, so uh, what when you look at brands and your shopping experience, who's doing it right? And then we can talk about who's doing it wrong. Yeah, I mean, there's so many people doing it right. I, I just think about like, I mean, I'm think, I I have a lot of love for smaller brands. So I'm probably going to be naming those. Like, I think about this brand um, called Big Fit Hero. Um, they made a really courageous and I think, um, you know, historic decision where they, as a small brand, decided they were going to stop making extra small, small, medium, and large, and just only focus on extending their sizing upward. And, and they were like, you know what? We are a small company. We understand that 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 the X, the extra small through extra large, the standard fit, um, they have lots of options. And these plus size, especially when we're getting into like 4X, 5X, 6X, almost no options. And so as a small business, we're making a decision from a values perspective and also from, you know, bottom line perspective that we're going to go after that market. Um, and it, it was so powerful. I mean, I think really because a lot of times what you'll hear the common defense, like, well, the margins, the margins, the margins, the margins. And, you know, and their whole thing is like, well, if you don't have enough resources to do you you've got, you've got to allot your resources thoughtfully you are making a decision when you only do straight size you have it's not like an apolitical decision it's not like a you know it's not like happening in a void you are making a call about where your resources are going and we're doing kind of the counterintuitive countercultural thing which i thought was extraordinary and very very amazing um I think about another small brand called Tamara Mollis. Very similar, very small brand. They do like underwear. They just do it, did a small, um, you know, clothing collection. But again, they're really focused on extending sizing, like making sure that there's uh, sizing available beyond like, and I mean, I think what's interesting and what's amazing is how quickly we've gone from like no plus size to now we're, and now we're in a point where businesses are really thinking, how do we go beyond three X? I mean, this is, it, it's happened at lightning speed, really. It's, it's really extraordinary. Um, but those brands are doing well. I mean, I love 11 on array. Um, I'm, I've definitely got an eye on, uh, what Nordstrom is doing where they're, um, essentially paying for well-loved brands to extend their sizing and they're bringing in people like 11 honor to be to advise them um another one is like dia you know dia.com they do like styling um you can you get a box kind of a thing they're they've always been there for the plus size market torrid has been like so, so they've really they're kind of like the fit standard in the industry um and, and they have just worked so hard on the fit and they're just so here for plus size women. So like all of those brands are, are amazing. Yeah, I feel like Torrid was the first. That's the one that was first on my radar. And have you found when some brands like, oh, you know, we're going to expand, they just, they don't re-engineer because my sense is it takes, no, you got to kind of start from scratch. If you're going to make this dress that you have in a size four, for a size, I don't know, the four X, you need to have you, you can't you need to redesign the dress yeah so are you seeing yeah. that who's redesigning and who do you buy something from and you go like well this is crap this doesn't really fit this just kind of you you're checking a box yeah i mean it, it kind of you know it's like I, I, to be honest like I, I can't think off the off the top of my head like the, the places that i've been really disappointed by i mean i'm just kind of thinking of, but you're right like i mean i will say in general 
um, you know, some, I, I feel like in general, it's like fast fashion that kind of you'll end up where they're just sort of cutting corners. Like, for example, you don't know, like they don't have a standard 2X or 3X, they don't, you know, like the, a 2X might be this big or it might be this, you know what I mean? It's just like, there's a lot of variability. Um, and, and I think that that can be a little bit complex, but I, I do think when I, it, absolutely. Yes. Like as you're sizing up as the body, um, as the body becomes larger, like there's more variety. Um, so like the diversity of bodies changes, like as you, as you go up in sizing. So absolutely. You need to be like designing with that in mind. And I think like, I've seen, like, I mean, I'm thinking specifically of, again, of someone who, who I think I'm really inspired by, um, is a thigh society. So they, so, so the founder really wanted, um, <clears throat> sort of had a traditional, like maybe finance job or something. She really wanted an anti-chafing product and she's like a size six woman. And, she, and her whole thing was like, as a size six, there was like, you know, that there's this idea that only plus size women have chafe. Women of every size from size two to size 22 experience chafe. And so she's committed her life to creating a like sort of like a, a very, very, very comfortable, well-sized garment that's forgettable. Her whole thing is like, no matter what size you are, I want you to be able to not have chafe and just forget that you're wearing a garment. So what she did is she had, and in order to create a forgettable garment, like a garment that you can just forget, put on and forget, she had to invest in these like enormous circle knitting machines. And each one is like $10,000 and each size, you have to, you have to have one for each size. Oh my gosh. I have to interview her. This is an amazing story. Yeah. It's totally cool. And so she was like, you know, a lot of companies, when they have these circle knitting machine or any very expensive technology, they'll cheat. They'll go like 2X, 3X, but it's actually a 1X, you know, or they'll, they'll say 1X, 2X, but it's actually just a 1X. And then they'll say like 3X, 4X, but it's actually just a 3X. And she's like, you know, I got a machine for every single one. And I, and I think like that kind of level of craft is just astounding to me. You know, it's like amazing. Wow. Okay. Uh, so who's, uh, g give me a horror story if you have one, either a shopping mm -hmm. experience or a brand that uh, really hit a foul ball. If you can think of one off the top of your head. Oh my goodness. I mean, I'm just trying to, I'm like trying to think, I mean, God, I've, I've, it's like, I have so many from childhood. I just feel like I'm, I'm so well, I'm, I feel really well resourced. And like, I, I think <laughs> one thing that's really common in like in, in plus, and when I say real resourced, I mean, like, I think in the plus size space, you get vouched in, like, it's not like you're shopping in a vacuum you're not, and you're not discovering new brands, a friend or three tells you about it and then you do it. You know what I mean? So right. it's kind of insular, we're sort of insular in that way. Um, and I feel kind of lucky about that. So I don't, I don't have any like horror stories that I can think of. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking again nice? of, of friends where I'm like a bridal. I mean, I haven't gotten married yet. So I'm like, but I, I'm, I'm already sort of preparing myself emotionally for like what that day is going to feel like, because <laughs> certainly that, that industry is like, you know, quite far behind when it comes to sizing. Wow. Uh, there's an opportunity bridal industry. <laughs> yeah. There's a huge opportunity right yes. there. I mean, but the thing also, I think the challenge is when you're using more material, say you use twice as much material, you can't charge twice as much um, because you just have to be smarter about it because that's, that's, I don't know how you do that, but that's not for me to decide. I did want to ask you though, uh, a couple more questions before we wrap up. And this has been wonderful. I thank you. And we're getting some great comments. Um, who can use the word fat? Now, fat in marketing, can you be kind of out there and use it? At Big Fig, they are not using it. Right. Uh, they don't feel like they can. Um, what's your thoughts right. on using that word in branding? Yeah, well, I mean, to go back to what you were saying, like, I mean, I think, again, the, the CEO of, of Athleta actually pointed out, like, would you charge twice as much for a size eight as you would a size two, is that even imaginable? Then why would you do it with a size 16? So I think it's important to recognize that we're already accepting this like higher material cost, but only for people of a certain, below a certain size. Uh, um, so I think that's an important sure. reframe. But like, I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, when I, I think about the word fat, I mean, definitely it, it's certainly like a specific flavor. Um, I mean, some people love that word. And I think that the people who love that word are probably, you know, they are in the minority. Um, they probably are a little more politicized. Um, I think certainly I've watched like these smaller brands who 
want to make that claim. They're like, this is who I am. And they're, they're, they're brands that are really driven by vision and really driven by their founder. Um, and their founder identifies as fat and as political about it. Like, you know, I, like again, Tamara Mollis, I feel like, you know, she's doing that and it's working and she's got like this, she's got this sort of, um, you know, narrow, but very deep niche that she's working with and it's working. Right. Um, so I think in general, right, larger brands are probably going to continue to sort of stay away from that word. Um, and I, I mean, again, I don't think anybody has to feel forced to use it or forced to adopt it. I think if it feels genuine and authentic, part of your brand, part of who you are, you know, use it. And like, and see, because I think that what's cool is, right, I don't know, I, again, like I don't see Old Navy ever using that word, for example. But if you're a small brand and you're very, again, vision, you got you, your vision, mission driven, you've got a strong sort of story, um, people who maybe don't love that word will still opt in. You'll still, you'll have those people, you'll like be talking directly to that like very committed, dedicated minority of people who identify as fat, but other people will find out about you and they're, they're I'm sure they'll be willing to overcome their slight discomfort if they love your product, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and a couple more questions, Virgie. Beyond apparel, uh, I think about travel, which, I mean, I don't know, do you reconfigure airplanes? All kinds of, what sorts of... Um, markets or products or services do you think uh need to up their game or are upping their game yeah, skincare I, mean, I don't know yeah um i mean i don't know like speaking of skincare like one thing that i find um <clears throat> like like makeup <clears throat> So a lot of makeup, and this is true of fashion in general as well, is really focused on minimization um, or flattering, which are which are essentially ways of of saying slimming, um, like and contouring. I sure, yeah, and I I think what's interesting is like you know like I've worked with many makeup artists, and I think a, you know, some of them totally know how to work, like do not see my face as something that needs to be minimized whoops my phone is ringing sorry um that's all right <laughs> it's we're live people we're live i'm live with virgie tovar of body positive university she's a fellow bulletin writer she is at uh body positive university .com. i'm of course and i'm just asking you to subscribe you can subscribe to her as well so you are back to makeup. <clears throat> yes. I mean, I mean, I've worked with um, makeup artists who, you know, understand that my face is totally fine and great as it is. Doesn't need to be minimized. Like I don't want my double chin to be minimized. I don't, you know, I don't need the, I don't want those things. Um, and then I've worked with people, you know, like I remember a moment where I was at a, um, uh, it was like a film festival and I, I was in the step and repeat and the photographer is like, let me give you a tutorial on, on how to, you know, look a little more slimming. I was like, I don't want to look slim. I'm not slim. I'm not interested in looking slim. Please take the photos. Um, you know, and I think similarly, right, like, I mean, this is, a, this is not exactly industry specific, but, you know, the photography from the top where you're trying to minimize your double oh, chin. Oh, I'm, right? I'm looking, I'm looking up right now oh yeah sorry. i'm just like you need to all stop oh, that no. oh no See, this is the neck <laughs> it gets the crepey neck out we all got our thing virgie we all we all got but our yeah. thing I would love to see more like in the makeup world, like, you know, just showing like fat people showing bigger, different, different kinds of bodies, different kinds of faces. Um, similarly, you know, another one that I deal with consistently is hair. Um, <clears throat> there are plenty of people who just, again, only understand hair and cutting hair and styling hair through the lens of slimming. And I'm like, I don't, you know, for example, if I'm like, I want, I want a short bob, but like, no, it won't work with your face. I'm like, it won't work with my face because you think my face should like, that's going to make my face. It's going to draw attention to my face, which in your opinion, from what you've been told is a bad thing. Um, and so like, the, you know, those kind. I think we need to all kind of like <clears throat> recognize this like implicit bias and actually leave room for the possibility that yes, there are people of all sizes who do not either like themselves or don't mind what they look like, who want to be serviced and taken care of in the body that they have, who don't want to be, you know, and it's, and I think the important thing is like, don't presume that somebody wants that. Um, I think that's the most important thing. A couple of last questions. Okay. Advice to brands who mm -hmm. are starting to dip their toe into um, being more size inclusive uh, to reach out to the community. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> 
I think, again, going back to what I was mentioning earlier about um, that athletic brand, Big Fit Hero, you know, be mindful about your resources. Um, so like if you, if you know you have limited resources, think about be intentional when it comes to the sizing. Um, think about who you want to serve and don't just automatically presume, of course, we're going to do X, extra small through large or whatever. You know, you don't that doesn't have to be the like day rigor like decision anymore. You know, so I just want to put that out there. I think another thing that I often tell people going back to something you said, <clears throat> Jane, it's like, um, when we're talking about 70% of the market, um, a lot of people, again, get really scared about sort of thinking about the plus size market and whatnot. And I'm like, you know, imagine a world where you're not worried about margins because you're serving the biggest population, like li literally numerically the largest population in the country. Um, so like, you know, imagine a world where you're not constantly kind of pulling your hair out, worrying about how to reach the market because you're actually reaching instead of 20%, you're reaching 70%. Um, so I like, I think that's important, right? So like think bigger. Like I, I think one of the things I often tell people is like being fat positive or body positive, is not just about, you know, being positive about bodies or bigger bodies, it's about being positive about expansion of any kind. And like expansion can include like your market, your margins, whatever. So that can be fat positive too. Um, I think another thing is like representation is really important. Um, like if you're going to start carrying products for larger bodies, you know, have, make sure that your visual assets reflect those bodies and don't be afraid of, don't just go with like the most conservative, safest plus size model that you can find, right? Um, you don't have to do that. You can actually have like larger body people. And at the end of the day, I think finally going back to something I just mentioned, like plus size customers want to know what their product is like, what somebody in their body type is going to look like and feel like around their product. They, they're not interested in what a thin person or like, you know, a smaller body person looks like or does with their product because it's not, <clears throat> that's not helpful. So I think like, instead of sort of presuming that everyone only wants to see a certain kind of body in visual assets, for example, presume, like give, give consumers a little bit of, of, of benefit of the doubt um, and presume that they want to be able to use your product and have like a good idea that it's going to be useful for their body. And last, uh, what advice do you give a plus size consumer who walks into a store and has maybe not the best shopping experience or is not being treated well? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different ways to tackle this. I mean, certainly like I've had moments where I've checked someone in real time, like an actual person who's being rude or bigoted. Um, you know, so if that feels like the right move, Certainly you can do that. Um, I think another thing that you can do is you can, uh, depending, I mean, I, I, like, again, it's different, different, depending on the brand, right? I think about like, if you have that experience at Old Navy, especially coming off of the fact that they're having a literal, a campaign around body positivity and, and inclusive sizing, you know, absolutely find, you know, either tweet them or send them an Instagram message, email them um, and let them know and, and figure out who the person who's going to get um, some reaction going, like, it might be a little bit surprising who the person who's going to get the attention of the right person is going to be. Um, so I think like, you know, any one of those things, and I think finally, right, like, you know, if you don't, if you don't, you don't have to be like, you do not need to feel the onus of educating every single person. Like, again, going back to my own experience where it's like, sometimes you just have to have the boundary of like, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not here to engage with you or educate you, your bigotry is your responsibility. I don't have to take it on. And I think the, the, like, actually the final thing I want to say is like, you know, at this point in my work, which I've done, you know, I've done this for 10 years. I think at this point, I'm able to see that when someone is having a problem with me, it's because they haven't worked through a trauma that they've experienced. Like they've learned that something is wrong with people's bodies and po potentially their own body. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, right, like they have not sought to resolve it or they don't even know that it is there. And so I think like having that moment where you're like, this person is acting from a place of unresolved trauma and that's unfortunate for them and kind of being able to sort of like be more compassionate. It. Yeah. Maybe turn it from anger to compassion, uh, which I try to do as people, when we're talking about masks and vaccines and stuff, I'm trying not to go off all the time, but <laughs> similar idea. Okay. Uh, so body positive university dot. Oh, I misspelled it there. Sorry. University dot I misspelled it. Uh, 
forward slash subscribe. Some of it is free. Some of it's behind a paywall. What's up next? Uh, for What are you writing about next? Yeah, I mean, I have a new piece coming out today for premium subscribers, um, and it's about what travel teaches us about our bodies. Um, and I kind of talk about my experience in Saudi and like what I learned, you know, with, with flying and whatnot. Um, yes. Uh, I, I look forward to that. And for me, um, I if you please subscribe, janewell.bulletin.com forward slash subscribe. I'm, I'm actually writing a story that'll post this weekend for Christmas on King Herod, who plays a huge role in the Christmas story, was one of the wealthiest men in the Mediterranean uh, area back then. Uh, but there was one person richer than he was, his arch enemy, Cleopatra. So it's going to be Cleopatra versus Herod and all their money. So that's coming up. So janewills.bulletin.com, bodypositiveuniversity.bulletin.com. Virgie Tovar, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your insights. Yes, thank you. All right, bye folks. Thanks for watching. Bye.